You're listening to The Human Upgrade with Dave Asprey. Formerly Bulletproof Radio. A state of high performance. You're listening to The Human Upgrade with Dave Asprey. Today, well, it's going to be a lot of fun. We've got our live audience from The Upgrade Collective, my membership and mentorship group. If you'd like to be a member, you can go to ourupgradecollective.com or just hit me up on daveasprey.com. Get to be in the live audience, but the reason today is going to be a lot of fun is that not only does our guest have headphones, glasses, eyes, and a shirt that all match, which has never before happened in almost a thousand episodes, we're also going to talk about why the human body can't be vegan and healthy because she was raised vegan, got sick, went paleo and is now working on healing other people kind of on a similar path that would happen to me. I wasn't raised as a vegan. Thank God I'd probably be dead. Uh, So congratulations on your resilience. But uh, (laughs) I was, uh, I definitely went vegan and it made me even sicker. Mm -hmm. So Monica Hershaft, welcome to The Human Upgrade. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Do you get death threats? I have gotten death threats. Yes. (laughs) Uh, that is a sign that you're making a positive impact in the world. Most of my death threats came from Joe Rogan fans um, who were mad when Joe Rogan decided to back another company copying my stuff. Uh, oh. But I've had hundreds of them. Oh, yeah. He did. I know he doesn't have control over what he censors from his show, but he did delete my three episodes when he went to Spotify. Whoa. But what, what I realized then was every time someone's talking about you, even if they're, um, you know, even if they're saying bad things about you, you're making a difference. So congratulations on your death threats. Appreciate it. (laughs) it, Now, there is an animal rights terrorist group out there. Um, They're called PETA. um, And it does not stand for the people for the eating of tasty animals, which I I thought it should. But these are actually people, some of whom have gone to jail for the, the crimes that they've done. And they will tell you that it's healthy to be vegan, not because they care about your health, but because they think animals and humans are the same thing. Um, I think we have a sacred connection with animals and that as a farmer, a small farmer, (laughs) I would never mistreat one of my animals and I would eat them with gratitude. But you, you kind of were raised as a vegan and you went over to the dark side of being healthy and taking care of our soil Mm -hmm. and our planet. Um, What was it like uh, to have this, this realization because you were conditioned from birth? Yes, it was, it was, um, I just didn't know any different. And I was being raised vegan at a time when people weren't vegan. That wasn't a thing yet. And uh, the real, the the animal rights movement kind of started in our living room. I mean, PETA was also started in our living room. Uh, the real the the animal rights movement kind of started in our living room. I mean, PETA was also started in our living room, um, <laughs> and uh, my dad was friends with Ingrid Newkirk, who started PETA with Alex Pacheco. And I remember when I was the little little girl, them talking about it. And PETA wanted to get more into the animal experimentation, and my dad wanted to focus more on the factory farming. And so they split off, and they did all the talk show circuits together, and. Phil Donahue, Dinah Shore. And I just knew that my dad was this great man doing all these big things. And he was on TV and we were going to these giant conferences with tons of audience and people. And, and I admired and respected him. And of course, didn't even occur to me as a child to think anything different because that's just how I was raised and that's how we ate. And Uh, You know, eventually when I did grow up and get sick, it took a while for me to even consider that it could be my diet. So it was a very big pivot mentally to make that leap. Is your dad still around? Yes, he's actually, they just completed a documentary on his life in Eastern Europe. Um, They were going, they did a whole European tour just a few months ago that's coming out in film festivals uh, next year. I, the thing that, that kind of, makes me sad is the message about industrial farming of animals. He's totally right. It's wrong to eat industrial meat. (laughs) It's wrong what we're doing just to be really clear. Totally. Totally. Yeah. And, and let me just share the story of how that, that happened for him because he was actually a scientist working for the EPA and he was assigned to go assess conditions at a factory farm. And so he walked in to do his assessment 
and just saw the conditions in this factory farm and the body parts and the screaming animals and the whole thing. And it, for him, the whole thing that makes my dad kind of well-known and in the community um, is because he was a Holocaust survivor. And so his connection to that was the way his family was taken off in cattle cars and the way they were killed. And, you know, um, that was what the connection was for him. So that's what flipped for him when he went into that slaughterhouse, which was a, a commercial factory farm. And, and so there was no idea that there was anything other than that. And right. so, and nobody knew about factory farms back in the seventies. That wasn't public knowledge. So he made it his mission to make those conditions public knowledge. And that's how it started. The, the deep seated trauma um, that's behind a lot of the, oh, I could never eat an animal type of, of vegans. It's something that we just have to talk about. Yeah. And I mean, there is no bigger trauma that I'm aware of than Holocaust surviving. Um, a, a member of my family through marriage was in a, a concentration camp mm. for specifically um, unhooking boxcars <laughs> full oh. of Jewish people. Wow. And he was not Jewish. But, you know, the, the trauma reverberates through the generations and it really does. And it's yeah. stuff that, you know, our family deals with and probably will a couple of generations from now, you know, the distributed family. Yeah. So like, I, I appreciate that you're, you're calling out the connection there. And if, if you know, this is life threatening and then you see animals treated that way, it's going to push a really deep button. And so this idea of compassion <laughs> for, uh, for the, the idea like, let's not do this to animals uh, because if you look a cow or a dog or a cat in the eye, they're alive and there's a connection mm -hmm. and you have to be a really bad person to do something intentionally cruel or mean uh, to them. Uh, and that's why meat isn't expensive enough. Um, and that's why distributed meat could be very affordable, but you, you can't do it the way we're doing it. So I, I just have to say, despite my terrorist thing, and I was at a university where they actually went to the houses, PETA members went to the houses of <laughs> the researchers who were doing research on chicken eggs yeah. and, you know, threatened their children and lit fires in their labs. And, and this was terrorism yeah. and it went too far, but the core of it, let's be kind animals. There's more alignment between the modern paleo movement, especially grass fed and PETA than anyone would ever think. Yeah. Um, but the idea to say being vegan is going to work for you man, it's tough. So what happened as a child? How, like, like what was it, you were eating? Tell me what you were eating. I'm, I'm guessing it was Satan, not Satan, but you know, the, the gluten well, stuff, but all the yeah. weird vegan foods from the seventies. Is that what you were raised on or? Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I remember, and, um, you know, we had family in Israel, so they had some interesting canned products that came from Israel that we were eating as well. But there was, um, and I just want to say, PETA is not the only group. There are a lot of groups like that that are doing terrorist activities. And that was one thing that did used to bother my dad a lot. Like he, he really had a problem with that. He felt like it made the whole movement look bad. But there are multiple groups that behave in that manner. Um, and But to get back to uh, growing up in the 70s, um, we really did a lot of that plain tofu. Like that was huge, you know, um, <laughs> like those, those blocks of white tofu, with, you know, and you would just, um, and, uh, you know, so I, I mean, I, I don't remember my mom cooking a lot, but, um, you know, it's kind of a latchkey child anyway, <laughs> but you know, it was a lot of those, um, you know, just uh, veggies and tofu. And um, they did have veggie burgers back then. I don't even know what was in them. It was just pressed grains mostly. I mean, there was it, there was a lot of wheat-based. I, yeah. I do feel like a lot of that vegan diet comes in wheat and soy are so predominant. So you get really high levels of wheat and soy in your diet. Yeah. Like and, crazy, because it's just yeah. the protein. It, they, it's like they throw away all the, the fiber and stuff, and all that's left is just straight gluten. Yeah, and when you're um, growing up in the 70s and you're eating that much soy and you're a female and, I mean – I'm going to bring birth control into it because as a teenager in the you know late 70s, early 80s, the type of birth control that was used back then was horrendous. It was really, really horrible hormones combined with eating soy all day, every day. It's kind of a recipe for disaster for the thyroid. So it trashed your thyroid uh, for sure. The whole endocrine system. Yeah. I had a lot of issues that I never recognized back then, but just emotional. And you just think, oh, she's a teenager. But, you know, there was a lot of a lot of mood swings, depression for no reason. And 
and, um, you know, outbursts and just didn't know what was wrong with me, anxiety and, um, you know, but other than that, I didn't really get sick. I never really had any health issues, but I had this stuff brewing and it, you know, it cumulatively builds over the years, like little layers until finally you hit that tipping point and then goosh, it's over. And for me, that happened at 34. Wow. It's it, it's amazing you made it to 34, but your dad, to be clear, he was a vegetarian. Yes. Like a, not a vegan. Did he go full vegan? Yes. Because I, I think vegetarians can probably be healthy with a lot of work, not as healthy, but you can get 80% of the way there if you're eating enough saturated fat. You're really careful, but you won't be as good as you could be if you had some marrow and some liver and whatever. But um, did he cut over to just no, you know, no, no honey and all that kind of really, yeah, really radical Yeah, I mean, stuff? hardcore. There was a whole fight at my wedding about it because um, <laughs> I remember he was friends with Casey Kasem back then. I remember Casey was invited to my wedding. <laughs> the DJ. You know? Yeah, I mean, they did. Well, because Casey Kasem was a huge animal rights activist. So he used to donate a lot of money to my dad's organization and he would speak there. And he was a sweet man. I met him before he passed. Um, but anyway, uh, he was a big part of the movement. And um but there was a whole thing with something to do because back then um, when I got married was when they still used film and cameras. <laughs> remember that? Remember that time? So I, I remember I, that time. I guess there Everyone was. says, where are your fat pictures? I'm like, do you remember what film is? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, there was something with film that was an animal rights issue, some process with film. So there was a big fight about the photos or something. And then, uh, but yeah, everything down to bees, honey, everything. And I don't remember what year he went vegan. I it was, it was when I was pretty young. Um, it probably says on his Wikipedia page. I just don't remember, but he, he's, he was vegan for a really long time. And, uh, and he was vegetarian before I was born, but the vegan thing started when I was little for sure. Okay. It's, uh, um, it, it's interesting because you know you're the the second, second generation of that. I'm assuming that he was vegetarian vegan before you were born. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so did you have like spina bifida, the flattening of the spine, lack of fusing of the lower spine that comes from eating lots of wheat, uh, teeth, cavities, none of that stuff? No. It, it's usually think... multi-generational from what Weston A. Price and people would tell you. Yeah, I know. And Weston A. Price does talk a lot about that. Um, but uh, for one thing, my mom, they're, they're both Eastern European. So they grew up eating all of the traditional Eastern European diets, which are a lot of heavy in organ meat and a lot of that stuff. Yeah. Right. So, so they had a good base growing up. Right. And, and my dad was in, I believe his, probably his mid to late thirties once he started being a vegetarian. Um, so, and my mom, you know, <laughs> she's the one that carried me. <laughs> so, so, um, yeah, I mean, so technically I would consider myself first generation really because they didn't grow up that way. They they right. kind of started doing it later in life, like not even in their 20s. So, um and I know my mom had me in her early 30s. So, uh anyway, so but but as far as uh the kind of vegetarian and how healthy you can be, let me let me be clear here. I we did grow up and I remember this clearly and you people from the 70s will enjoy the reference. We had Pepperidge Farm cake in the freezer. We <laughs> had um the Reese's peanut butter cups. We had um pistachio ice cream. That was my dad's favorite before the vegan thing started. Um and uh and all of the foods that we had were processed and everything, you know, that's when microwaves came out and everyone if you were cool, you had a microwave and you used it. <laughs> and so <laughs> If you're if you're 25 and listening to this, <laughs> um, there are things in your life where you got the first one of that that won't register for another 10 years. But I remember getting my first microwave. I remember getting my they first were huge. Walkman. Yeah, they were huge. The first Walkman and my first MP3 player. Long before um, you could buy uh, an iPod or any of the other Apple things like that. And you look back, you go, "Wow, that was actually kind of a big deal." So yeah, the microwave was a big thing and that ruins food anyway, whether it's vegan or not, right? And especially the early microwaves, they were horrible. You're listening to The Human Upgrade with Dave Asprey. So yeah, the microwave was a big thing and that ruins food anyway, whether it's vegan or not, right? And especially the early microwaves, they were horrible. And uh, anyway, so all of our food, you know... <laughs> 
<laughs> it wasn't like, oh, healthy vegetarian. Like eggs would be the only healthy thing that came out of being vegetarian. The rest of it, my dad, for as long as I can remember, he's been a sugar junkie. It's like the soy ice creams and all that kind of stuff once he did go vegan. So it's really, it's really not, he didn't do it for health reasons. As we know, he did it for ethical reasons. So he's never really been in it for the health. He's been it for in it for making peace with the survivor guilt. I I actually can respect uh, respect that it it's when the the people with an agenda conflate health benefits with something they're doing for another reason yeah that strikes me as manipulative and then there's a a dishonesty thing because as I mentioned I, I was a we'll call me a, a devout vegan not for animal rights reasons because I became convinced that that was it just a raw vegan just a regular vegan all, all sorts of stuff. Um, as I was trying to lose the 100 pounds I had to lose. This was before I had to go bulletproof to restore my health, which got much worse after oh, a year plus on the vegan thing. But um, when we talk about deaths per calorie, it was a, a llama in Tibet, uh, like a Tibetan llama um, at a monastery. And I pointed at a yak skin on his prayer pole in the middle of the compound. And I said, you tell me no killing yet. That looks like you killed that yak, didn't you? And he laughed at me. They loved like spirited debate in Tibet. Like it's a part of the culture. So it wasn't, I wasn't being offensive, but uh, he laughed and he said, one death feeds everyone. And I came back and I looked at the deaths per calorie from eating a pound of cow every day. And it turns out you're killing between 0.3 and 0.5 animals per year, including the entire life cycle. Cause it's on prairie that, we didn't have to destroy the ecosystem on that prairie as long as the cows weren't too dense. Um, so, you know, there were no butterflies killed, no turtles, bunnies, rabbits got sliced up by tractors. Uh, it, it actually is far less than some of that tofu where ecosystem destruction happened for it. So I, I feel highly ethical from an animal thing as long as no one tortured the animal before I ate it. And I don't eat industrial meat for that reason. Like I, I'll be vegan at a restaurant if they don't have grass fed. Yeah, that is the key. And that's what I talk about. And I did a talk at Paleo FX about this exact thing. When people say, how could you make this ethical choice? I said, well, yeah, it's an ethical dilemma, right? But so in order to make peace with it, I don't eat animal protein if it comes from a factory farmed source. I just not going to do it. If I'm at a restaurant and they don't have either wild caught fish or free range, you know, pasture raised, grass fed, animal protein or whatever the case may be, then I will skip it. I just, it, if you're getting it from a paleocentric farm where they have humane kills, it's a whole different story. And not only that, but that exact same piece of steak that's factory farmed will actually make you sick and be bad for your health and hurt you. Whereas the opposite, the uh, humane raised paleocentric raised animal protein will actually heal you and repair your body. So it's a no brainer. It it is a no brainer, and if you're really into environmental and animal rights things, have you ever looked at how much plastic waste comes out of a hospital? No. Well, you do not want to be in a hospital if you're an environmentalist. Everything is single use, wrapped in double plastic for everything. Wow. So if you're saying, "Oh, my vegan lifestyle, which makes you sick," let's be really clear: it actually does. Um, it is going to result in a lot more visits to healthcare facilities, which are also going to be environmentally destructive. And if you're tired and anxious all the time and you're eating a bunch of whatever tofu to fuel that tiredness and anxiety, you're probably wasting all of your time on earth here. Well, I have to tell you a little secret. Um, and obviously I'm not naming names, but I've had multiple people, multiple people reach out to me secretly that are vegans and they're not doing okay, but they don't want people to know that they reached out to me and they ask me if I can help them. So that's a thing. It happens all the time. I, I, someone, I'm not going to name her, but who's a guest on the show was a vegan with a big vegan community and I got her on Bulletproof Coffee. And it was like, when you see that, that happened that first time, it's, it's like this sense of relaxation comes through. Another time, the, the fiance of a friend is very high in the supplement industry. He had told his fiance who was pregnant that she had to be vegan. And I said, this is nonsense. And I walked the both of them over to a restaurant that had grass-fed meat. I pulled out a stick of grass-fed butter and I put a huge hunk of butter on the steak. And yes, I carry grass-fed butter in my little man purse sometimes. <laughs> and, uh, and, and then she ate like a prisoner. And, and she put her hand around it and she just wolfed it down and made the sound like oomph, oomph, oomph. <laughs> and I remember my friend looked at me and he goes, Dave, I think she likes you more right now than me. 
um, <laughs> because the 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 core need to nourish another life in there, this is nourishing food. And I can tell you, you don't get that same response from a vegan pizza. It, it just doesn't work like that. Or a salad or kale or any of that stuff. It simply doesn't give you the power to make another life uh, at your maximum ability. So that that sense of lack creates the anxiety. And that's what I felt when I, especially after probably about two to three months of being vegan. And what you describe, the flightiness, the ungroundedness and you see this quite a lot, all the jokes about angry vegans. Well, there's a little bit of a truth in that. By the way, angry fasting people and angry keto people who overdo those, it's a very similar mindset. So not to you know just pick on vegans, but the ungroundedness that happens from that, it's a real thing. And in fact, I got a text right before the show from uh, a friend um, who has been vegan for decades and um, had her first piece of bacon over New Year's <laughs> and is feeling better. <laughs> so like, who would have thought? Um, it's, uh, uh, it, it's one of those things where we have the drive and something in us stops us from acknowledging the desire for that because there's a voice in your head that says, oh, that's wrong, or it's going to make me fat, or it's bad or something. Your voice came from your parents where do you think, you know, kind of vegans who just pop up out of nowhere who's, who weren't trained that way, where are they getting the voice that says, you know, if I, if I eat meat, somehow X is wrong? Oh, well, that's easy. I mean, organizations like my dad's and like these other animal rights organizations are, are disseminating information in order to try to get people to go vegan because they want to save as many animals as possible. So they're going into the schools, they're going into social media, they're, they're disseminating marketing um, doing demonstrations, whatever they can to get the word out. And I understand that because that's the passion behind it. That's, that's how I feel about what I'm doing <laughs> with my work, <laughs> you know? So, so that's where it's coming from. It's coming from, you know, and especially the, the younger kids that they're hitting, um, you know, because a lot of the little kids don't have that, um, mindset of like, oh, I'm eating something that used to be alive. And so there's a shock when there's a child, you know, and they have that realization. So I've seen it. I mean, I've, over the years, just in all of the different conferences that I've attended, you know, over the years. Um, and that's what those conferences are for. They have these conferences, you know, where they disseminate information and they have like, you know, if you look at Paleo FX and how many vendors they have there, it's, I don't know, 30 or 40, 50 vendors, maybe, who knows, there's so many. It's like a giant. That's how it is at these conferences as well. There's like every possible different organization you can think of that has a booth. And then there's plenaries and talks, multiple talks going on for days and days and days and days. And, and you know, and also then all of the TV and the radio and all of the mar uh, media. So. so it's a, it's an orchestrated campaign mm -hmm. um, yeah. of I'm I'm going to call it I love this word now misinformation it means stuff I disagree with um, that's yeah. all that word means but uh, and anyway it, it is is I would say it especially what the health was probably the height of just propaganda where the guys who made it clearly don't care about health at all they just go oh, we'll we'll say anything in order to get you to do what we want you to do yeah um, I have another little story about this so one of the the raw vegan um, real famous guys is um, my friend David avocado wolf oh yeah I know who he is <laughs> right and uh, he's got a big following online and um, I he and I and, and all vegans really and I we have way more in common than you'd think uh, where if you're interested in health yes and interested in preserving the environment yes interested in reducing cruelty to animals yes now the path to do it, I'll argue, I'm killing less animals than a vegan with what I'm recommending, but okay, there's debate there. So he asked me to speak at his conference, and I said, all right, guys, I'm a lacto-ovo-bifo-porco-vegetarian. I hope that's okay. And like, they're going to hate me or they're going to love me, and they, they love me. And I gave a talk, and I said, here's why you should have grass-fed ghee, which is clarified butter, with your vegetables. Because you'll make more use of the vegetables, because if the cow is local and organic and all that, no animals died, you made healthier soil, and you'll feel better. And two things happened. One, I came back the next year to present, and I took a poll, and two-thirds of the audience was doing uh, ghee, so they were no longer technically vegan. And David also started selling ghee, because it actually worked, and it's in alignment with the principles. Even if you're an animal rights person, well, don't do industrial milk. That stuff is terrible for you. Like, I don't do it either. So that was interesting. But then I went to the hotel and I said, you guys must hate this conference. It's a big conference, thousands of people. So you must hate this conference because no one will order your room service, right? 
And they started laughing and they said, no, no, no. This is our biggest conference ever of the year for room service orders. I said, what do you mean? He said, oh, everyone just orders chicken and all the other normal food up in the rooms and they eat all the vegan stuff down here. And literally the highest revenue. So there's a lot of people who want to be vegan because they believe something, but their body won't let them. Just like trying to quit smoking, like you just naturally reach for the cigarette. Your body will naturally reach for the healthiest foods and those healthiest foods contain animals. Um, and then the question is, how do we make it so it was healthy animals, not unhealthy? So I, I thought it, it was funny. And, and this isn't hypocrisy. Some of the guys from that grade collective are saying that. This is a fundamental mismatch. If you tell yourself a story <laughs> and the story is not reality-based, you're going to, to go ahead and try and do this and then you're going to fail and you're going to feel guilty about it, but you're still going to do the things that make you alive. Also, breatharians. I've, I've heard from two different people who have been very close with so-called breatharians. They're so convinced that they can live on just air that they oh, don't yeah. know I've that they're met, eating I've a Snickers people. bars. There's yeah. like a Snickers yeah. bar wrapper yeah. in there, but they don't know they ate it because the body will take over and make you do something, including order room service if you've <laughs> just been too vegan for too long. That's just how it works. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, let, let's get back to what happened when you were in your 30s. Yeah. Uh, because you lasted a long time, especially having grown up like this. Mm -hmm. Did, you had, I'm assuming, PMS and hormone issues and anxiety issues you mentioned before you were 34, right? Yeah. I mean, um, well, and I was on the pill, so, oh, you know. Okay, that would do it all by itself on this, right? <laughs> yeah, um, and, uh, but, but just to explain what happened in my situation and what was so astonishing to me when I did get sick, because I, I'd never heard of holistic in my life. I didn't even know what that was. Uh, so I just would go to the doctor if there was a problem, but I never had any illness issues prior to this. And so what triggered this was, um, I, I was an actor back then and a lot of my friends were doing this big trendy detox program in LA and I was like, oh, I'm going to do that. And I got violently sick really fast on this detox program. And um, I started having severe symptoms right off the bat and kept waiting for them to pass because, oh, this is a detox reaction, but it was getting scary. And uh, I had, I stopped sleeping. I was sleeping maybe two hours a night, my heart palpitations, um, really severe anxiety, and uh, I couldn't eat solid food without pain. And so uh, they were giving us a lot of supplements on this detox program, and uh, they kept sending me to the doctor to get checked out, and the doctors kept telling me nothing was wrong with me. So I had a weird, this is where your higher self knows, right? I was like, hey, I'm a vegan born and raised. It, could that be the problem? nope, diet's got nothing to do with it, nothing to do with it, and you're fine. And I was like, okay. So then I would go, keep keep pushing through, get worse and worse and worse. Now the skin's coming off my face and bleeding for no reason. I can't even stand up long enough to take a shower. I can't drive because now I am not gauging distance properly and I'm hitting things in my car and I feel crazy. And so again, go to the doctor doctor after doctor, because I've got really good Screen Actors Guild insurance, so I'm using it. And I'm going to the top specialists, every single one of them. Your diet's got nothing to do with it. It doesn't matter that you're vegan. Your labs are normal. You're just being dramatic and being treated like a hysterical female. And, uh, you know, eventually I got to the point where I quit the detox because I was scared I was going to die. And after about three months, on this stupid detox program, I was wrecked and nothing worked. Nothing. I couldn't. Wow. I was sensitive. I couldn't be around anything or anyone without getting sick. I couldn't breathe any little tiny piece of chemical, a cigarette smoke. Um, I couldn't be around a sick person. I just had no immune function left at all. So, wow. uh, yeah. So, uh, eventually I had a friend of a friend referred me to an osteopath and he found a problem with my phase two liver function, which is how you detox. <laughs> and, Including detox all the vegetable <laughs> toxins that you don't hear about from the vegans. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, basically this detox was pulling all the toxins up and then they had nowhere to go. They were just trapped. And so, uh, cause, cause you know, phase one is you're bagging up the trash phase two, throwing it out. That didn't work. That didn't work at all. So basically, um, uh, I went to the, my first holistic person 
and um, they had me on a ton of herbs and all kinds. They were doing all kinds of stuff. They were using that zapper machine on me and acupuncture. Oh, the whole like zapper. That yes. was way 80s. I, yeah, I made one of those myself. <laughs> Didn't work, but <laughs> Didn't <laughs> was a good shit. Idea. <laughs> Just kept getting sicker and sicker. And yeah, and was, my whole life was revolving around it at this point. I had to quit acting. I couldn't even come out of my trailer. I remember I was on a sprint commercial shooting 10, 10 second spots for football season. I shot one spot, went into my trailer, never came out. I could not physically get up again. And that was the end of it for me. And I knew I was in trouble. So once I found out that phase two liver function wasn't working properly and I couldn't detox, there was no solution to fix it. So um, eventually after years and years and trying different people, and every single time my higher self knew and I would go, Born and raised vegan. Is that a problem? (laughs) (laughs) Everyone was like, nope, nope. I finally get to this one person and they were like, yeah, I actually can't heal you if you're going to stay vegan and I don't want to waste your time and money. Now, my dad was there (laughs) because at that point, at that point, I couldn't take care of myself anymore. I couldn't even do laundry. So he had flown out to like help me and drive me to appointments and stuff to try to figure it out. In the beginning, no one believed me. And now at this point, I was far enough gone. I I'd lost so much weight. I couldn't even fit into a size zero. It, you know, at first everyone in Hollywood's like, you look great. And then it, <laughs> and then, then it gets to the point where it's not good anymore. And uh, so basically um, my dad was there, so I couldn't say anything in front of him, but I was like, if you tell me to drink my own pee, I'll do it. If, you, if it gives me my life back, I don't care, whatever it takes. Are you serious that no one ever told you to do that? I swear to God. <laughs> so, people tell me to do that i tried it once i'm like that is not good that is also how they survived in the holocaust fyi but anyway uh, that's another story but uh yeah so basically um we get back to the house and i literally took my cell phone and went into the bathroom and snuck into the shower and got on the phone and i was like hey it's not a car shaft i'll eat the meat tell me what to do <laughs> Oh my God, so you were really desperate, like as close to death as you could get. You're listening to The Human Upgrade with Dave Asprey. And I was like, hey, it's not a car shaft. I'll eat the meat. Tell me what to do. <laughs> oh my God, so you were really desperate, like as close to death as you could get. Yeah. Um, Wow. I I have seen so many very unhealthy people in the same thing, but I, but I I believe this works. I I call it the vegan trap where when you first go vegan, which you didn't have to experience because you were always vegan, but you actually feel better than eating the crappy industrial animal junk food diet. So then after six weeks, you know, it works. And then when you start getting teeth that crack and you start losing bone density and you're anxious all the time and you can't focus and you're forgetting words and you're getting sick all the time and you have thyroid problems and autoimmunity, I'm just telling my story real fast. And all of a sudden you go, well, it's because I'm not vegan enough. Like maybe I, I heated up to 119 degrees, not 117 yeah. degrees. And you start doing these weird behaviors because you know it works. And, and it's that cognitive dissonance when finally you're just desperate going, I, this is just not okay. What could let me let me phrase it real real perfectly here. What could someone have told you when you were sixteen years old that would have gotten through to you and said, "Eat some meat already to help you avoid all the pain that you went through? Uh, nothing because um, <laughs> I mean, in my situation, it would yeah. it would have been I had no health issues, so there was be no impetus to make me do that. Yeah. I'd never and been it, sick a day in my life at 16. I, I was not only was I super healthy, I was a dancer. I had danced at the Kennedy Center. I was like very athletic. I was, you know, there's nothing you could have told me. And I also try telling any 16 year old anything. <laughs> that is- that, that's a fair point. Okay. Let, 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 <laughs> I'm actually going to really own that. I've got a, a 14 and a 12 year old. So, <laughs> so let, let's go up to maybe when you were 20 or 24. Um, it, is there something, is, is what people in the Upgrade Collective here on the chat, and, and also what I want to do is, how do you get through to someone who is choosing a vegan lifestyle, either for animals or for health, where it's not doing either one of those? What do you say? What's the magic incantation to get them to just go, oh my God, I'm going to reconsider my lens on reality? That's a good 
question, but I don't think that I'm a typical representative because of the fact that my dad started the movement. This was in ode to our family who had been murdered in the Holocaust and all of the people that he watched get tortured and killed and as he was growing up. Um, and so I wasn't going against an idea. I was going against my family, you right. know, and my legacy and why my dad survived the Holocaust. It's, it's not like it, it was. It doesn't get bigger than that, right? <laughs> yeah. maybe, maybe it, oh, and you went against God too, right? <laughs> well, there, there is there's... no God in this family. No, my well, dad's well, an atheist. There isn't a higher level that you can go other than this. You want to start getting religious. Right. So <laughs> well, tell me what happened when, when you first sat down and said, dad, I, I, I've been eating meat so I could survive. Well, how did that go down? So I lied for a year because I wanted to be sure it was going to work. And um, in the beginning, he was living with me. So I was sneaking wow. out and I was sneaking out and like getting like, you know, in the beginning, I, I didn't eat red meat at all. I just started with eggs and fish. And literally, like, I remember my very first time eating it, like eating and I'm like, crying and then I'm eating and I'm crying. And it was just like this whole emotional saga. But I was also like, hey, if it doesn't work, he never has to know. And then no, nothing lost, right? Like, you know, I tried. Yeah. But if it did work, I was like, he saw how bad this was. He saw how bad this was. And if I look so much better, how can he deny that? So I... Uh, he left because I started doing better, but he didn't know, obviously, that I was sneaking out and eating animal protein. Wow. And uh, I had like friends helping me. They would keep stuff at their house. <laughs> and oh, uh, oh, and it was a whole like <laughs> setup. Like it was a whole system. <laughs> and, a movie about this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a few movies. Uh, but yeah, and so then, you know, he, he flew back east and went back home and I still wasn't well enough to, you know, be fully functional, but I, I, was, I was a lot better. And, um, and so as I started getting better and better and better, uh, I, you know, after about a year and at this point I had already gone to Florida, started getting training because I was well enough to use my brain again. I still was having problems with solid food, but things were improving. Um, it wasn't until like about a year later that I went to see this guy in Malibu. He was like $500 for every 15 minutes. He was really expensive. <laughs> and, uh, and back then that was even more money than it is now. And, um, and he was the one who was like, you're not going to get any better unless you eat red meat. It's not going to happen. And I was like, I don't want to eat the red meat. But I was like, I don't know if we can curse on here. So I just stopped myself. <laughs> mm -hmm. I was, I was like, screw it. I basically, you know, really looked into what happens with the pasture raised organic animals to make peace with it and everything. And I always had to get stuff that was already cooked. And so basically I noticed a huge difference when I started eating red meat, he gigantic, like huge <laughs> Night and day. Not, I mean, whoa. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. and then at that point, I was like, oh, I'm never stopping. I'm never stopping this. I'm never stopping. And so in the beginning, when I first told him, my dad's kind of a stoic dude anyway. He's not like a reactive well, human, which kind of, are, kind of they're, annoying. They're an unusual breed. <laughs> yeah. I and mean, they've seen so much. I, I respect that. He just does. Yeah, so he's he, not he reactive. Prepared. Yeah. Yeah. So, right. so he basically, you know, kind of gave me a blank stare and was like, um, okay, so how long are you going to be doing this? And I was like, <laughs> no, no, <laughs> this is, I, I'm not stopping. <laughs> um, I, I don't want to get sick again. I lost 10 years of my life, you guys, 10 years. Like, it wasn't like, oh, I had a rough year. No, a decade, baby making years, wiped, in bed, not okay, wanting to die every day, thinking I was dying. And, um, you know, I said, look, you, I, and I, I said exactly what we just said. I said, do you remember how bad it was? Do you remember how much I was suffering? Nothing I tried. I tried to get, and he also knows, I tried as a vegan. I tried everything as a vegan mm -hmm. to get my health back. I went to every, I mean, he was paying for a lot of it because I couldn't work. So literally 
I tried every doctor, every specialist. I flew places and got specialists. I went to every holistic person, like anything someone suggested I would try. I literally was like throwing spaghetti at the ceiling. And um, I said the I literally started to get better as soon as I started eating animal protein and it keeps getting better and better. And I don't want that to ever stop. And, um, so in the beginning, I don't believe that he, I think it took him time to like process it. And, and then he asked me to lie to people because Mm -hmm. I, I think he was embarrassed, you know, but I was, I was starting to become a practitioner. So that's when social media was starting. Facebook was starting. Um, there was no Instagram yet. And I was promoting it. And I also wasn't, because in my training for my certification, we were trained that we can't heal vegans or vegetarians. That was part of the training. We use supplements that have animal glandulars in it. (laughs) It kind of worked. I literally (laughs) was like, I can't lie. It's like, I, this is how I'm making a living now. Do you want to support me for the rest of my life? Because this is what I'm doing. (laughs) You know? Wow. Yeah. So, uh, so that got tricky. And then eventually it took about a year. It took about a year. So it was a year that I didn't tell him. And then it took about a year for him to like, accept it. I mean, for some people it would have been like maybe back in the nineties coming out gay to your family. Right. So like, it, yeah, it's, it's on that level. <laughs> I mean, and, and people are terrified of, of coming out gay, but I think in your family, it, it probably was worse to come out as, as a meat eater. I, I mean, the pressure yeah. there. there was so def- are you guys definitely. okay now? I, I mean, yeah. do you do you sit down at dinner and you're eating some beef jerky and he's eating some tofu and and, and there's yeah. things are things are healthy? Yeah. I, I because, Congratulations. That's thank cool. Thank you. Thanks. But I, I had I had to be willing to lose the relationship to stand up for what my 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 truth was. Do you know what I mean? And it's like I was like, I can't be promoting to other people and healing other people and then be a liar. Like that's not, I can't. And so, um, uh, I remember when we did go out to eat one time and I had ahead of time, I didn't do it just at the restaurant, but I said, look, if we're going to have a relationship and if you want me in your life, you're going to have to get okay with this because I can't be a vegan and be okay. There's no way around that. So if you're going to prioritize that over my life, that's your choice. But otherwise, wow. you're, you're I'm going to be eating animal protein at every single meal because I believe that that's how I can keep my life and my health. And I don't believe that I should skip it at any meal. So if you're going to be places with me, you're going to have to get okay with that. You don't have to pay for it, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I will order it. And if otherwise, just don't eat with me. I'm not going to not do that. So yeah. Okay. So then where did you learn clean boundaries like that? Because did you do a whole bunch of like work with a therapist along the way? Or was this just part of that? That is a seriously powerful move. And it's very hard to have that conversation with your parents for anyone. It is. Um, It is. I don't know. I don't know where it came from. I, I had a really weird childhood. Um, I think I got left alone a lot (laughs) because my dad was building this, animal rights movement. (laughs) And, and, you know, I just kind of like, I don't know, I just became an adult really fast. Um, I left high school when I was 16 and got a full-time job and was supporting myself. And, um, I don't know, I just, I've kind of always had that for whatever reason, I guess I just kind of take after my dad. He's got an independent personality and I guess I, I'm a lot like him. I guess I'm a chip off the old block. (laughs) There, there you go. Well, well, congratulations because um, survivor. <laughs> yeah, and you were you were desperate, yeah. right? It was life um, or death for me. No joke. Like it was not like oh, I'm not feeling that well. It was like I I really thought I was going to die. In your experience, uh, working with people who are recovering from a, a, a vegan diet, it seems like, and in mine too, it, it seems like there are some people who would die if they weren't carnivore. In fact, I don't think carnivore is a great lifestyle for almost anyone just that. I think you need some fiber to feed good gut bacteria and you should cycle and all that stuff that I've talked about a lot. But um, Diane, who's here in the Upgrade Collective, is saying like, yes, I eat some animal protein, but if I eat it more than a couple times a week, I get sick. And if I eat too many eggs, I don't feel good. So it's like some animal protein, but still largely plant-based. And how much of this is individual versus how much of this is like population wide? Like, are there actually people who thrive as vegans? 
I don't multiple, think you're going to like my answer, but this is just based on my experience and training and in, you know, working with a lot of patients over 15 years. Um, if, if that's the truth and, and I, it's, I just had this conversation yesterday, weirdly with one of my patients whose wife describes exactly what Diane just said. Um, but if, if you can't eat meat more than that, and it's the right kind of meat, like it's, pasture raised organic, free range, blah, 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 you know, pasture raised organic eggs, then something is, in my opinion, off in your system that needs to be like corrected. Like a liver or a pancreas, a detox pathway. Or, or it's not working. Well, or, uh, and part of this is what we practice in, in the work I do is if your nervous system is switched, neurogenic switching or blocked to, it could be an overgrowth of fungus. It could be overgrowth of bacteria. It could be viral, especially nowadays with all the shedding. I'm not going to get into that here. Um, or if it's, um, you know, uh, or parasites that are, uh, that are overwhelming the nervous system, or it could be metals or chemicals. And that nervous system gets reversed, which is the parasympathetic and sympathetic. It's the neurogenic switching. Then you're body's not working right and it's not able to assimilate the food you're taking in properly and use it efficiently, which means that your HCL, your hydrochloric acid has been inhibited from being produced properly. And that's why I have never had one person come into me. And I've had a lot of people come in and say exactly what she just said. And I got all of them eating animal protein three times a day with no problem at all. And they do amazing. Mm-hmm. And step one would be betaine HCL, which increases stomach acid so you can absorb that stuff. And step two is probably protease and lipase digestive enzymes, I'm guessing. Those well, at the I would also say that it depends on the body because um, like, for example, I'll use, I use standard process for those types of things. And there's a lot of great supplements out there that just is the yeah. one I'm trained in. But we can't give betaine HCL to everyone. And I've noticed that the older people, like 40 and up around, it's not a, a hard and fast rule, but people in their 40s and up usually do better with the betaine. The younger ones usually need Zypan, which is not just straight HCL, but it has some other stuff in it, um, and uh, which is interesting because um, our bodies are producing different levels as we get to different ages. But that being said, if you're having that problem and the HCL is not the issue and your neurogenic switching is being caused by an overgrowth of one of these pathogens or too much toxicity, in that case, the HCL can actually make it worse. Interesting. I haven't come across that too much, but I'm not trained in in um, in your uh, your school there, uh, which is uh, which is interesting. I don't know a lot about. I know about sympathetic and parasympathetic, but talk to me about neurogenic switching a little bit. Walk yeah. me through what that is. Uh, kind of just give me the mini lesson on it. Yeah, no problem. Um, and and let me also just say that um, this is, I also am attracting people that have chronic mystery illnesses because of my story. So that's yeah. why I me get too. a lot of those cases. But, um, but basically, uh, and we do the muscle testing, um, the applied kinesiology. So, um, so I'm going to give you a brief little description of what we call the five layers to illness, which is just some a pattern I've noticed in every single person's body. So, you know, all illness, and we all, I'm sure, agree with this. I'm sure, Dave, you agree with this too. All illness starts with inflammation. Duh. So usually the initial layer, the bottom layer of inflammation is toxicity, whether it's, you know, it, you can even get it in utero from your mother because people go, well, how come babies? How come little kids? Hello, uterus. So, yep. you know, and how many vaccines did you get the second you were born nowadays compared to in the 60s, right? So it's just a different story, right? We so, have a very aggressive schedule now um, for, for that, for sure. 74 doses now, and there were six when I was growing up. So yeah. anyway, that's another but it, it's illegal for vac- <laughs> It's illegal for vaccines to ever do anything that's not perfect, so we can't talk about that. It's okay. Correct. Yes, we're not talking about that. So anyway, the bottom <laughs> layer is toxicity that's causing inflammation that's disrupting the immune function a it's sort of in the way, right? But if that goes unaddressed, it's like the drops in a bucket and it cumulatively is building up. That suppression keeps getting unaddressed. It starts to impinge on your body's ability to make the digestive enzymes and hydrochloric acids you need. So now the body is not using the nutrients properly. Now that starts to get exacerbated and that's the second layer, right? So now when that happens, now you're not using your nutrients properly. Now you're getting food allergies or sensitivities. Yep. And so when that happens, you start to 
have a harder time, you get into what we call an allergic state, which allergies are basically an inflamed immune response, right? That happened to me. The, the raw vegan thing really gave me serious food yeah. allergies I did not have before that. Yes, yes. So we call that the allergic state. And that's, we look at the vagus nerve. And so like if, if uh, when in the muscle testing, when we push on the vagus nerve and that goes weak, that's allergic state, right? So basically then at this point, you still might not be switched, but you're not, using your nutrients now. So now that's totally impacting your body's ability to protect itself. Now the bouncer is not at the door. He's on a coffee break. And anyone who comes to the door that wants to get in can just walk in, meaning bacteria, fungus, parasites, virus, blah, blah, blah. So now the next level is pathogens. That's your fourth level. It's not enough to show up in labs, but it's messing you up. It is in the way. The fungus is growing tree roots in your intestines, causing little perforations. That's the leaky gut. Now the undigested food's getting into the bloodstream, causing an autoimmune response. And it's like, ah, chaos, right? Now it's like a rave in there. And so basically when you get, <laughs> so when you get to the next level, that's bad labs. Now you got bad labs, right? But anywhere in those last couple layers, you can get switched because when this stuff isn't getting addressed, and you're eating any sugar or dairy or GMO, or you have metal fillings and you're getting exposed to a lot of toxicity and you're getting chlorine in your water and you're getting every vaccine out there. <laughs> now at this point, your body's like, I'm done. <laughs> and so the first thing that happens is the neurogenic switching. So how that feels is like a roller coaster. It's like better, worse, better, worse, better, worse. If you try to take some kind of remedy or something like that, you might have the opposite reaction to what you're supposed to have. When you want to go to sleep, you're really awake. When you're awake, you want to go to sleep. It's kind of like a opposite day. You know, like on Seinfeld, the opposite day is like opposite day. So then when you get into the blocking, that's when the switching goes unaddressed for too long. Then it becomes blocking. And that's like if your car is has a boot on it, you go to start your car and you're like, ah, oh, man, there's a boot on my car. It, it won't move. The brakes and the gas don't work. That's blocking. So blocking is basically nothing you try works. Nothing. And so mm -hmm. when, when that happens, you have to address and prioritize what's causing the blocking or the switching or the other things don't work. That's why if you take HCL and let's say you're blocked or switched to bacteria or to viral, the HCLs aren't going to do anything because your body's just going to go, I can't even process that. So that's how it works. <laughs> it, it's, it, it really strikes a chord with me because I look at all the stuff that was going on. And keep in mind, I grew up, I was obese as a kid. Um, I likely had Bartonella from a vampire bat. Um, what? I'm special. Uh, I certainly had lots of toxic mold exposure and thyroid issues since I was young and, and all that, but fungal overgrowth, heck yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, choline deficiency, heck yeah. Leaky gut, yes, since I was a little kid. Food sensitivities that got much worse when I went vegan, yep. Thyroid problems since diagnosed in my 20s, but probably since I was a kid. Um, so pretty much all the stuff you're talking about and some parasites and whatever else rolled in, uh, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, all of it. It's like a party. Oh yeah. But is this a classical presentation for someone who showed up as one of your patients? Yep. Yeah. And, and why did I, <laughs> why did I try a vegan diet? Because I heard that it was going to make me healthier and I was mm -hmm. desperate. And mm -hmm. I would say that the, the vegan propaganda around it being healthy preys on desperate people. Yes. And I was a desperate person. And when it didn't work and I noticed that it wasn't working, I said, I'm going to actually go deep. And that's when I started doing all the research that led to the whole Bulletproof Diet thing, which is a little different than, than paleo um, because of the intermittent fasting and the cyclical nature of it and, and things like that. And a very big focus on detox pathways and charcoal and glutathione and all those things that, that are tool sets that you use. But you say something that I haven't heard anyone say before. Why do all vegans have candida problems? Oh, <laughs> um, well, uh, it's interesting too, because I want to point out that candida is the precursor to cancer. Yeah, there's that. And that's actually documented in lots of studies. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and it's not just in this, I mean, there's that Italian oncologist who ended up going to jail for treating it like a fungus, but he helped a lot of people. Um, but uh, so basically, aside from the fact that so many vegetarians use wheat and soy as a base, 
uh, which does feed fungus uh, and also uh, throws off your thyroid function, your mineral absorption and all of those things and your hormones. And so that's all contributory to the imbalance, right? Because imbalance is what causes the body to not work right. But you're also looking at a zinc and copper imbalance when you're a vegetarian or vegan. And so, you know, zinc is important for the pancreas to function properly. And so if you've got this zinc copper imbalance, that affects your pancreatic enzyme production. And copper is, I was just getting into a whole debate on social media about this yesterday with someone, but basically copper and fungus, it's like they're dancing partners. They're like, they, they do this. An extracellular, <laughs> and, an extracellular copper outside of cells, not copper. Yeah, 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 yeah. The top, exactly, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And, there, and that's what's tricky is some metals, there's the helpful metals and there's the toxic version, right? And right. so, and so copper... Um, acts almost like a conduit. So it's like, it's almost like, oh, the fungus wants to like chelate the metal, but also like it uses the metal. I just did a quote on this yesterday. It's so funny, but the fungus uses the metal to thwart the attack from the immune system. So like if the immune system's trying to like handle the fungus, the copper helps the fungus avoid it. In fact, if you have mercury, the body will allow candida to be there because yeah. candida will store mercury instead of your brain and liver and nervous system. And um, if the so copper is not thing. available, it'll grab onto another metal. So yeah, fungus and metals are the big thing. And I mean, truth be told, I don't know a vegetarian or vegan that doesn't have a lot of metals because what we just talked about. So if you look back into the soy and the wheat concept, right, and you're missing what all the animal protein does, of course. And then um, basically... What happens over time is that when your uh, when your thyroid is out of balance from eating this way, and especially with soy, because soy inhibits mineral absorption and affects thyroid function, right? So your thyroid is how you absorb minerals. Minerals are, and metals are the same thing to the body. The body doesn't know the difference. The reason it holds on to mercury when you get your fillings out, you have to pull that mercury out. It's not going to go on its own because the body thinks it's minerals. It's going to hang on to it, Right. So it's the same thing. The body's not letting go of metals because it thinks it's minerals. And if you're deficient because of your vegetarian or vegan diet, and that's inhibiting your thyroid from working right, now your thyroid's confused. It's like, I don't know. I don't know how to absorb minerals. That looks like a mineral. But no, it's not. It's mercury. So basically, then you become metal toxic and the body gets confused and it actually leaves you minerally deficient. So yeah. I had massive issues with candida for years, and I have not had Me issues too. with it for years since you know, going down the the stuff that I teach. Yeah, I was but, queen of yeast infections throughout my entire teenage years. <laughs> oh wow! So you were having some of the early signs of this, but they just they seem that normal. was normal. It was normal. Yeah. Everyone had them. <laughs> yeah. Plus, plus birth control. Make, right. You know, that whole yeah. combination is yeah. just is just terrible. Yeah. Um, and I yeah. I look at. Oh, and the other thing I didn't ask about is um, orthostatic hypotension, that low blood pressure uh, thing. Uh -huh. It seems like that's also common in vegans because it's an autoimmune thing. Do you see that a lot? I haven't seen that a lot, actually. Okay. Um, I mean, I don't attract a ton of vegans outwardly. I have vegans who reach out to me, but then <laughs> they don't actually <laughs> do it. <laughs> they just reach out. Uh, so... I, you know, because I think a lot of people in that community have heard of me now at this point, just from social media and things like that. But um, one of the things you brought up earlier that was the main problem for me is the choline deficiency. So, and that was something that we didn't talk about. But the reason that my phase two liver function was failing was because I was so choline deficient from being raised without any animal protein. Um, got it. And choline is essentially a B vitamin, even though we don't really call it that. That's highly present in uh, animal products, especially liver. Um, and you can get it from soy lecithin, but it's slightly different, probably a little yeah, bit more no. saturated. Actually, it's okay. funny you mentioned that because the supplements mm -hmm. they had us on for that detox program, they had us on high levels of soy lecithin. <laughs> <laughs> because yeah. they were giving us a lot of niacin. And what I didn't know, and what I'm the one who figured it out, none of the doctors I went to, none of the practitioners, I just used Google. And I found out that if you do high levels of niacin, it makes you more choline deficient. And I was like, wait a minute, doesn't choline come from meat and eggs? <laughs> and I was like, I'm probably already choline deficient. And that's how I figured out how I got sick, because I was doing this detox program on a choline deficient body. So choline is how your body does, it's not the only way, but 
but choline is part of the phase two liver function, right? So it, it helps the gallbladder, it helps with breaking down fats. And so, and it's also your nervous system, like the heart palpitations, not sleeping. As soon as I started taking high levels of choline, I started sleeping through the night for the first time in 10 years. Wow. And yeah. when you say you were taking choline, um, when I formulate cognitive enhancement supplements as well as detox things, um, there's a group of people who use alpha GPC. That's the stuff you'd find in like alpha brain or something like that. I'm I'm not a fan of that because of what it does to cell membranes. Uh, there's also CDP choline, which I am a fan of because it raises acetylcholine levels, which is a neurotransmitter. But then there's choline that's used in cell membranes and in the liver itself. And you can take straight choline or phosphatidylcholine. And you can take it as a liquid or as a capsule. So which of those or which, which of those do you like or not like as ways of raising choline in the body? I don't have any knowledge outside of standard process because that's what I was on from my training. And then that's okay. what and I Standard process is a brand. It's for listening. Yeah. It's, a, it's a physician brand. I think Heritage in the 1970s, known for really high quality uh, formulated stuff using uh, really traditional things, but it's a trustworthy brand, I'd say. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think they're the only supplement company that's been around since 1928. Yep. Um, uh, so they, there's some really cool stuff like, uh, and I think, an arsalic acid form. There's some things you can only get from Standard Process, but you have to yeah. order for a doctor as far as I understand. Uh, yeah, that's true. And I carry them. Uh, but yeah, at Royal Lee used to work with Weston A. Price and Royal Lee started Standard Process and he used to be a dentist and him and Weston A. Price did a lot of stuff together. They were buds. So um, that's why I love a lot of the Weston A. Price stuff. And uh, in fact, uh, they have a really good article on the China study myth as far as the vegetarian vegan thing goes. It's really cool to check out on their website. The, the China study is such a it's such a bad book. And I read it was one of the reasons that I, I went vegan. And you realize yeah. just if you do basic thinking in the first chapter, they're saying, here's why all animal protein is bad because a highly processed milk protein extract of casein increases cancer. Therefore, all protein increases cancer. And it's just not even logically coherent. Like, oh, because spider venom or mung bean extract, both of them can kill you. Therefore, all protein kills you. Like, it's just at that point, <laughs> people should put the book down and the rest of it is suspect. Uh, but man, it, it's it's very well written to convince you to do something, but it does throw out a lot of info. So there are listeners here who still think, but the China study, it's just been so thoroughly, I don't use this word lightly. In fact, I almost never do, but I'm going to say debunked. Because when you yeah. debunk something, it means the person who wrote it knows it was bunk, right? And <laughs> maybe the guy thought it wasn't bunk um, who wrote it, but I would just say it, it's it's provably wrong. Yeah. I mean, the article that they have on the myth of the China study on Weston A. Price's website literally goes through and just breaks down. This is false for this reason. And here's the reason this is false. <laughs> like It just goes through and breaks the whole thing up. Um, good. Um, and that's on, you said the standard process site or? We Weston A. Price. Oh, Weston A. Price. Okay. Yeah. And for or, listeners or Price Pottinger. Yeah. Okay. For, for listeners who are unfamiliar with that, and, and it might be someone who's new, and I've written about these guys in my fertility book in 2011, in the Bulletproof Diet in 2014, it's all, all these things. But Price and Pottinger were dentist anthropologists who traveled around, noticed changes in, in teeth and skeletons in people who started eating cooked food and started eating processed food. And then uh, the uh, Weston A. Price Foundation has been promoting the benefits of regenerative agriculture and grass-fed animals with science going back more than 50 years. And so I, I would consider them the original pioneers in the difference in how you treat animals and how it ends up making us and our soil change. So you're going back to the roots of the movement and our elders usually know stuff we haven't figured out yet. So I kudos to you for, for giving any of that the time of day <laughs> given the way you were raised, right? And no one can blame you for that, but it just it takes a certain amount of courage. Thank you. Um, are you familiar with the Pottinger's Cats video? Uh, absolutely. That's um, a big one. <laughs> like, why don't you tell uh, tell listeners about that? Because it's, it's incredibly convincing if you want to be a raw vegan because then everything should be raw. But um, yeah. I was a raw, a raw omnivore. I ate raw meat for a while when I stopped being a raw vegan to get healthy. Wow, so. wow. Yeah, I actually had um, that video on... Um, on my YouTube for a while, I had the the heart, the DVD copy of it that I had bought from, I think they still sell it on westnaprice.org, but it's a really fascinating video. And when you start to watch it, it almost feels like a joke video because the music and the opening, it reminds you of like 
if any of you are old enough probably, but when you used to see videos in school when you were in class and they would put that educational video up and <laughs> with all that, it's like very uh, weird in the beginning. You have to get through that beginning part. And basically they were doing um, uh, adrenalectomies on these, there were a bunch of stray cats around basically. And he was doing, um, I don't even remember exactly what he was working on as far as an experiment goes, but he, these cats would come and he would feed them scraps and, um, and so he was doing experiments and, um, I think he was doing adrenalectomies and he was trying to get them to survive without these adrenal glands. And I don't remember all the details around that beginning part, but basically in a nutshell, they, he started working with these cats long term and he divided them into groups. And so he was feeding some of the cats were getting raw, real food and some of the cats were getting processed food. There were three different groups. Do you remember Dave? There was raw, there was processed, and then there was something else where I think it was just straight up junk food. Uh, there were, but there were three yeah, different- One was grain free or something like that. One was like cooked meat and milk, and the other one was raw meat and milk, and the other one was, I think- One, one was really stuff. bad, and they found, yeah. this was crazy, they found the ones that were in the really bad group became crazy. Like yeah. they started attacking each other and trying to kill each other. Their kittens were born with skull deformities and and messed up teeth. That's what you were talking about with the teeth that made me think of it. Yeah. They were they were having weird sexual aberrations and doing weird sexual stuff to each other. They, like they were cats. Stuff that was like you should never trust cats anyway, but you know, yeah. Yeah, but it was just <laughs> this group, right? And so <laughs> But anyway, so, and then they started finding that the cats that would survive the adrenalectomies were the ones that were eating the raw, real food. Um, and they, and they would survive the adrenalectomies, whereas the other ones would die pretty quickly. And so that's kind of it in a nutshell. I'm kind of probably, I'm probably well, screwing it, it that up. It's interesting but, that the yeah. three populations of cats, the ones that ate the cooked meat and milk yeah. would get they would still get fleas and they would have parasites. And, yeah. mange, and they would go nuts. Like they that. would like go crazy. Yeah. They were like throwing themselves against the gate and everything. Like right. yeah. And the healthy ones that ate the raw stuff were um, abundantly healthy and the fleas just didn't want to eat them. They would go to the weak ones. And I yeah. see the same thing in my, my garden because I'm on an organic farm with pigs and sheep and cows and chickens and all that. And in the, in the garden, I'll plant, uh, oh, what is it? Uh, fava beans, which are just not very good food for humans. The yeah. aphids love that stuff and it attracts the aphids so it doesn't get on the good stuff. Like, yeah. like they, they want the weakest plants, I, I swear. <laughs> but you just said something really important though. And I want to, I want to bring that up because like I, okay, so I used to have this dog and she never got fleas because I had her on this program and she was on the supplements and I kept her body balanced and she had long hair and never got fleas. And, um, but what you said that's important is parasites, right? You talked about the aphids. People are built to repel parasites. And if you're eating the way you're supposed to eat, you will repel them because you're a mammal. You're going to get exposed to parasites all the time. They don't stop at the border. They don't go, oh, it's the United States. No parasites allowed. No, no, no. They're everywhere. When you go to a restaurant, when you are intimate with another human, when you pet your animals at home and love on them, you're being exposed to parasites all the time. And whether or not your body takes them on and decides to host them is based on how you eat and the condition of your body. And I literally can get exposed to anything now and my body will just reject it. And that's the true of exactly what you just said. It's like the parasites are attracted to a certain state or condition of the body. Yeah. They, they're looking for deficiencies and weakness so they can, they can move in. Um, the scary thing about Price and Pottinger is that I would say there's abundant evidence that eating raw meat is probably the healthiest. Yeah. And, and maybe <laughs> maybe bone broth if it's not overcooked to give you histamine or something to get minerals out of the bones. Yeah. So, you know, raw marrow, raw liver, uh, but then you have storage issues, which creates histamine and you have you know, food safety issues. So I literally would would take thin slices of all that kind of stuff and, you know, soak it in either um, lightly iodized salt water or in vinegar, kind of cook it in vinegar, and then I'd eat it uh, when I was getting healthy and recovering from being a raw vegan. Unfortunately, I put it on top of a salad with kale in it because I didn't know what I was doing. Um, so that, that was long ago uh, before I came up with these principles. But I, I do find that properly cooked meat seems to work fine. But if you char it and deep fry it, it creates a huge problem 
Uh, and so it, you, you have to do it right, whether you're charring your Brussels sprouts or your meat, it's bad. Talk to me about cooking methods and what you found when you started eating meat. Was there a difference? Because uh, you don't even know how to cook meat if you've been a vegan, like you burn it to death. I still don't cook it. I don't know how to cook you it. You wrong? <laughs> or you just go to no, restaurant? No, no, no. Oh, okay. I, just, I just get meal delivery companies to do, you know, I really, I'm single. I don't have time to be cooking. <laughs> Just, there you yeah. go. I, I just I, got cow I, on the cob. I just walk out front and take a bite. It's yeah, it's totally fine. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah, I pretty much just, you know, there's some really great meal delivery companies. I vet them because I like to refer them to patients because the biggest complaint I get from patients is I don't have time to eat like this. And it's like, okay, I have just the right thing. But yeah, um, so there are some really great companies, even like I live in Scottsdale, which is been new for me because I lived in Los Angeles for 30 years. So I knew I had all my resources in Los Angeles and there's so many there. And now that I'm in Scottsdale, I'm learning, you know, I found a few different meal delivery companies where they use the right oils. They don't have any fillers or gums or any of that stuff, no uh, sweeteners. And it's really clean food and exactly how it should be. So I just indulge in that. I really don't know how to make them, <laughs> but I've got my, my good foods list. And, you know, <laughs> I mean, I have no one else to cook for, but me. So I'm like, eh, <laughs> just getting my, <laughs> I, I, I love that. Um, is there uh, well, you're in Scottsdale now, but mm -hmm. what are you, like your two favorite food delivery companies? Cause I'm getting requests from the upgrade collective. You, you can oh, drop yeah. a couple names if they're, if yeah, they're yeah, absolutely. Well, um, there's actually a brand new, I'm going to tell you a couple restaurants first and then I'll tell you meal delivery. So, uh, there's a new restaurant that just opened called Sante that just opened in Scottsdale. It's all organic. They use all small paleo farms. And even when they do use dairy, it's raw organic. Like they're really clean and no, and no bad oils, no canola in the restaurant. And then um, I also like using, there's a couple of chains I use like Flower Child. And um, it's you have to be strategic to not order something that has soy there, but they still have really good clean ingredients. Um and then, uh, and if you like Mexican, there's Tokaya Organica or Toca Madera. They're also organic, free range, grass fed, um, no canola. And then um, there's this place in Scottsdale called, um, oh gosh, what is his name? It's a it's a it's a paleo restaurant, and it's called Sapiens. And he oh, also yeah. does meal delivery as well. So he does uh, like home meal delivery, like a meal delivery service, and then. Fran's Kitchen was who I was using for my patients since I opened my practice here. And Fran, um, she's fantastic and she does everything exactly by the book. So it, it's fascinating to me that in, in Scottsdale and LA and, and a few other places, there are now more than a few restaurants who just don't use bad oils. And we've been open for about seven years in Santa Monica at what used to be the Bulletproof Cafe. Now it's the Upgrade Cafe. And I've opened one up here, but it's different than a vegan restaurant or even just a, a paleo restaurant because you go to a lot of the so-called paleo places and, oh, yeah, we've got sweet potato fries, but, like, what would you fry them in? And, like, it wasn't towel or butter. They it always was add inflammatory sugar. Oils. Yeah. And they always add sugar to sweet potato <laughs> fries. What is with that? Um, they just can't help themselves. So it it's, it's cool, though, that there is a growing change. And one of my portfolio companies um, is now figuring out how to make oil that is compatible with our bodies without having to go out and get it from uh, from cows, like via fermentation processes. And I think that's going to be a game changer because I think if you can get a lower price for a healthier oil, then we can get you know, the big chains doing this and shifting oils would just change everything, even if people are still not gonna eat anywhere near as well as you do or I do. And both of us, frankly, we've both been pretty sick, so we're more strict. Yeah. Than oh, speaking of, this is an interesting point. I don't know if you heard about this since you guys were based in Santa Monica, but this was a really big scandal a couple of years back. It was right before COVID. Um, but you familiar with um, the restaurants that are in the Los Angeles area? There's Gracias Madre and um, uh, these are like vegan Mexican places, right? Uh, yeah, they're vegan, but they they own they own two different uh, chains. They own Gracias Madre, and the other one is the one where they're like, "What is love? What is blessing? What is Cafe the name gratitude. of that place?" Thank you. Yes, Cafe Gratitude, and so that's the same owners. And there was a big scandal in the uh, vegan movement because they started uh, they basically went paleo. Yep. So the, the restaurant stayed vegan because they wanted to respect that, but they realized that they were having health issues staying vegan. So they started raising cows and they started eating animals and the vegan community obviously went nuts because. 
And the funny thing is when they, yeah. when they went nuts, they had too much omega-6 oil from the nuts and they got even weaker. <laughs> so I, I, I'm just telling you guys in another 50, 60 years, there will not be a <laughs> vegan community because they have a hard time reproducing and because they have a hard time showing up in the world the way they want to. And, well, and that's not, that's not to, to make fun of anyone or anything like, like we can do better as a species. It has to be compatible. I don't care what your belief systems are. Either it works or it doesn't. And we can measure that it's not working. Yeah, but they were getting a lot of death threats. A lot of um, people were um, uh, not banning them. What's it called? You know, cancel culture. With the uh, they were. Uh, oh, they, uh, they should have just changed yeah. their pronouns, and they couldn't have been canceled. They, they <laughs> totally so that, yeah, nice if anyone tries to cancel me, I'm immediately just becoming you know. I'm they them. <laughs> so, I, in fact, I should have those guys on. I, I used to be a huge fan of Cafe Gratitude when I was a raw vegan, and then their, their desserts are amazing. Um, they also oh, had a lot I of know. problems with uh, with like landmark uh, sort of being accused of being a cult and all sorts of stuff. So it's it's funny if you're listening to this show and, and you're kind of new to the health movement. There's a long history that goes back decades for how things got to be the way they are. And because I started working with people three times my age in my 20s, sometimes I get the stories and, and you realize, oh my God, that, that really did go back to 1928. And this, you know, this really did happen. And even what you're hearing from your father, that there's a heartfelt desire to not put animals in concentration camp-like conditions. And you know what? He's totally right. Right? The the indecision of that, I don't support very obviously, but the idea behind it, but to understand how a movement starts and how it percolates for ages, and you look at cornflakes and all that stuff to reduce testosterone and and things like that. What? Is that really the origin of graham crackers was to make guys masturbate less? Actually, it was. What? You, do you know about that? <laughs> okay. How could you not know this? I thought you would be pretty simple. I have to talk about this. Tell me. Okay. So you've got Dr. Kellogg and Dr. <laughs> Graham way back in, was it 19, early 1900s? And they decided that male sexual desire was the root of all evil. So they were going to make foods that suppressed sexual desire. They didn't know it was suppressing testosterone, but it was. And that was the origin of the low-fat grain-based graham cracker and corn flakes because they would do that. And then they had all this stuff around um, circumcision. They liked it for women and for men, but it only stuck with men. So the reason there's so much circumcision in the US is these two guys, they were huge fans of multiple daily enemas, whether you liked it or not. And you know, telling boys, especially, you know, no masturbating because that creates sin and eat this food that makes you weak so you won't masturbate. That is the origin of big food. Wow, I had <laughs> not heard all about verifiable. that. Look it that up. That is wild. <laughs> it's it's almost not believable, but this is not like like this is not subject to to uh, oh that's just what you think. No, this is well written down. The guy was a, a reverend, <laughs> and like what? this was the religious belief. So you look at how we get here. You look at the origins origins of so many common nutritional things. They are batshit crazy. Yep. And all I care about as a biohacker is. Show me the labs, show me the data, show me the heart rate variability function, show me my cognitive yeah. function, show me my reaction time and all the other variables that say, am I performing well? Am I feeling well? Am I aging well? And I'm going to do what makes those numbers change. And I don't care if people like it or not because it either works or it doesn't. And mm -hmm. you just have to remove dogma. And there's paleo dogma. Uh, mm -hmm. which is which is pretty wrong at this point. You can only have so much almond flour before your kidneys hate you, right? Mm -hmm. And you can remove vegan dogma, you can remove fasting dogma, but does it work and does it work for you? And mm -hmm. what you're doing in your practice is finding people where it really didn't work. They followed the dogma uh, until it, it really caused them problems. And then you're figuring out the layers and the root causes and then peeling them off and getting people back to normal the way you and yeah. I had to do. So kudos to you. It, it's, it's really Thank cool you. that you're doing Thanks. that. Thanks. I really appreciate that. I mean, I just have to say, based on what you're communicating here as well, is we are all in agreement that the factory farming is not the way to go. It's not good for anything. It's not good for your body. It's not good for the animals. Even the people that work there have issues with being abusive in their families because they're so yeah. abusive at work. There's the stories of what they do to the animals with the pitchforks and they throw them and they stab them and they do all these horrific abuse to these animals laying in their own filth, open wounds, miserable, in the dark, squished together in the ammonia. All it's all has to stop. 
So if we all stop eating it, then they can't make it anymore. So let's just stop. Tomorrow. And we need to support these paleocentric farms where the animals are, like you're saying, Dave, like outside, in the sun, in the grass, enjoying life. Humane kills, not in a state of terror. You know, the way things are supposed to be in that hierarchy. And that's how we're going to get our health back, period. So if you're listening to this and you're vegan uh, or sort of thinking about things, the only path forward where animals survive and animals are treated well and we have enough topsoil, we have 60 years left at the current rate, is to have animals all over the place shitting everywhere. And that means we give them a good life while they're doing it. We give them a place to shit and then we eat them when they get old. And and it's it's how it's always worked. It's the only way we will survive as a species. Otherwise, humans will make ourselves extinct and Mother Nature will make some other weird octopus with claws to take over the next (laughs) intelligent niche a million years from now. That's how it works. I mean, stop shooting them up with hormones. Stop (laughs) shooting them up with antibiotics. Just stop. Just leave it. Just stop. Yep. Uh, The antibiotics in animals, nope, especially just as a preventative. So there's so many things going on. And the answer is you go to a restaurant, is it grass-fed? You look at them and they say, oh, we don't have anything grass-fed. You go, great, I'm not eating the steak. And then you oh, I'll have some veggies and some rice. And do you have any real butter back there? Yeah, if we all do do. that, then they will start providing it. So let's let's start a movement, people. Um, It's uh, it's how it is. And same thing goes for your pet food, right? You got to feed your animals the right stuff. So I'm we're we're so aligned, and and I'm hoping when vegans hear this, like we are on the same team. I want you to be healthier than me. Unfortunately, you can't do that with what you're eating and you're killing more animals than I am. So let's join forces. Let's eat ethical meat that is treated well. You'll kill less animals, you'll have more energy, and then you can go out and make the world a better place the same way we want to do. So it's yeah. like 90% aligned. Um, and I, I really hope that lands with people because it's uh, it, it's really where I'm coming from and I can tell us where you're coming from. Um, yes. And, and just you know, before we end the show, I am just really impressed at the amount of courage that it, it took mm. for you to say, <laughs> I'm going to tell my parents that I'm doing the most horrible <laughs> thing that I could ever do. And yeah. not only to do it, but then to be able to maintain a healthy relationship with your parents after that, that's probably one of the hardest things that I can imagine you've done. And, and to go out there and just, you know, be who you are and, and survive. So kudos. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Your website is monicahershaft.com, M-O-N-I-C-A, and then hershaft.com. And you also have treatthesource.com. Yeah. And you're in Scottsdale where you practice. And guys, you should follow her on social media as well. What are you, mostly on Instagram? Is that your top thing? Yeah, mostly Instagram, yeah. It's under monica underscore hershaft underscore health. The username, I think, is treatthesource. But we're going to start producing these events now, these micro events locally in different cities and, um, you know, to match people with practitioners that can help them, that can help them with the nutrition, with the supplements and help them get their health back on track, deal with the blocking and switching. And just because too many people are just running around sick without any answers or solutions. So, you know, All right. coming, to, coming to a city near you. <laughs> you know what you're talking about because you lived it. And Mm -hmm. uh, you've got, what, 13,000 followers. So guys, go to, it's Monica Hershaft Health, or just, I searched for uh, Treat Treat the the Source. source. And I found you right away. Um, You should have more people following you. You make good content as well. Thank you. Just just want you guys to know, there are people out there who really believe, and they change their mind, and they get healthier. And I was one of those. You're one of those. And if you're listening to this, you might be one of those. You don't do everything I say. Don't do everything Monica says. Just do what works. And do what also has a follow-on effect on the environment that's good for you. Everything we've said today fulfills those three things, but measure it and and try it out. Thank you again. Thank you so much. Great to see you. You're listening to The Human Upgrade with Dave Asprey. 